Hello and welcome to Financial Education for the Nation. It's back to university. This episode has been sponsored by IDELO, the price comparison website. Hi, how are you today? Hope you're keeping well. Things seem to be going through the summer. We're getting to the end of summer. We're getting to that time when we've had the results for the A-levels and now the GCSEs and it's back to school time. It's back to school time and after the A-level fiasco with all the results and the GCSEs and everything else, I kind of feel that it's to end a bit of time just focusing on those poor students going back to university and uh, going back to university life. University life. Um, it's going to be a bit different this year. A lot of remote learning and a lot of um, sort of smaller class sizes. I'm not sure how they think that's going to rest- stop them socialising in big groups when they get out um, into the uh, clubs and bars and everywhere else. But <clears throat> I guess they're doing what they can uh, with the resources and the powers and the skills that they've got um, to make sure it all is student life is normal. But it's going to be different. But what's not going to be different is the cost. So the cost of university life can really rack up, obviously depending on the course you're doing, but um, it's going to be expensive. It's going to be expensive. Now, um, with university life being the first place many of us actually learn about money skills and budgeting, um, and hopefully if you've read the money plan, you'd have started this with your, any children you might have already. So it's, you know, start at home, start young. But for a lot of us, when we go off to university, you know, it's very easy just with tuition fees to start going over £30,000 a year. Uh, it's just shy of £10,000 a year. Um, and that's before you start adding on the books and the photocopying and printing and everything else. So um, it's not an inexpensive experience because then on top of that, you've got, uh, have got to live. And, and I'm hoping that this video will sort of shed a bit of light on how you can get the most out of your experience with spending the least amount of money. <clears throat> so i um, just cover some of the obvious things that most of you will know already, but I just want to make sure, just in case you don't, um, you've got the tuition fees. So two main costs, education fees, which is the tuition costs, and maintenance, which covers everything else. So tuition fees are... Um, you can get a loan for those. It's not mean tested. Um, everyone's entitled to a loan, and that loan payment should be implied for by now. It takes about six to eight weeks to come through. So, if you are hoping to go away at the end of this month in September 2020, um, you really need to get a rig along to make sure that that's sorted out. Those payments are paid straight from the student loan company to the university. You don't really need to get involved with that, other than make sure you pay it back uh, when you are required to do so. Um, but that covers the cost of university. It's not free, it's going to cost you money, and you're going to come out with at least £30,000 if you're taking that loan there. Okay, in addition to the fees, you've then got to live which the loan companies kind of call maintenance. And that's going to include everything from your accommodation to your food, to your workbooks, to getting around your drinks and everything else. Okay, so then you've got your maintenance money. Now, you can apply for a maintenance loan as well. And depending on your um, family's financial background, that is means tested. So what I mean by that is wealthier families will be entitled to a lower amount than less wealthy families. And I think the assumption behind that is wealthier families will be supported by their wealthier students. Now, let me rephrase that. Students from a wealthier family will be supported by their family. Whether that's true or not, who knows. But it's means tested. So in other words, students from a less wealthier family are entitled to a higher amount. Also depends on whereabouts in the country you are studying and where you're from as well. So um, there's lots to go in behind that. But, you know... That is not a necessary, an asse- it's not a given, you don't have to take it out. And I do understand it's expensive to go to university, but if you plan properly, okay, if you do this properly, you can do it without taking out all these loans. Um, so, you know, the maintenance loan is kind of optional. I kind of get the tuition loan, you know, saving up £30,000 and your subsistence and travel and everything else, that's going to be a hard um, pill to swallow. And what I always do say is if you're going to borrow money, borrow for an education. 
and borrow for an asset. And they're the only two rules that I'll have. You know, borrow for an education, so obviously going to university, and borrow for an asset. If you have to borrow for maintenance, then you have to borrow for maintenance. I want you to get your ed education. I'd rather you do that than not get it. But hey, you know if you are able to save, invest, and work during the summer and get some money together, then do so and try and avoid taking the maintenance load out. <clears throat> so, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. But also, don't forget, there are plenty of um, scholarships. So if you are academically gifted, if you excel in sport, if you excel in music, get onto your university and see what um, scholarships are available. And also bursaries and grants. So if you're from a lower income family or... Um, your personal circumstances dictate that you might be entitled to one of these, then get on and apply for them. Apply for all of them that you can. You never know. Some of them might come back and support you um, through this um, period of your time um, to help you get your university degree. If you are going on to university, have a great time, but get a degree, get an education, both academically and in life. Um, some of the friendships you make there will be with you for the rest of your life. It's exciting times, exciting times. Um, but how to survive financially, which is really what I know about, um, it comes down to organisation. It comes down to planning an organisation. I know that's not exciting, it's not fun, but once you've done it, you can then go off and have your fun. Okay, so there's a couple of things you need to do. First thing, you need to go to warrenshoot.com and download the Student Survival Guide. I've been running this now for, I think, five years. I don't it might be less, it might be more. Um, and it's basically my guide to help people through university. And the very first one to where it is now, it's ten times as good as it was um, our first draft. It's actually been read and used by students. And students have come back to us and said, no, you got that right, you got this right, you should improve this, or this is excellent. Uh, so we've taken all that feedback on board. Um, and when you use it, if you have any feedback for us, please um, let us see it. So it's actually been compiled by me, but it's been tested by students um, who have kind of gone through it and come out the other side and said, yeah, those figures look about right. We, when we went, that's what we spent. So the Student Survival Guide is a booklet, a little ebook um, that helps you with some key pointers, but also is a cash flow spreadsheet. Now, I think it goes to 36 months. <clears throat> But if you're a four-year degree course, then just add on another 12 months at the end of that. And what it does is you put in all your costs in there. So it's pre-populated. You edit it. You put in all your costs there. And it tells you when you need to start earning money and how much you need to earn. So you can start organizing job placements during Freshers' Week. Okay, so you, or even before, so you go to university and you go and find yourself some kind of bar work or delivery work or shop work or whatever it might be. So you've got some money coming and you know how much you need to earn. Um, and when you come back for the summer, you can like line up that work before you come back so you know you're going to do that. And the outcome behind the whole of this thing is you'd have a fantastic time both at university but also when you graduate and you come out the other side. Because it's, it's kind of like a false sense of hope, isn't it? If you have a fantastic time at university and you're just prolonging the debt and you get to the end of it and you think, oh my God, how much did I spend over those three years? And then you start saying, is it worth it? And really the whole idea really is for you to come out the other end and say, I had such an amazing time. I met some fantastic friends. I've got the degree that I wanted and the um, result that I deserve based on the effort that I put in. And I'm in control of this amount of debt or lump of debt possibly or no debt if possible. Um, and I know where I'm going from now on. OK, so um, the... Student Survival Guide, I think, is a fantastic document. Um, please give me your feedback. Tell me how it can be improved because it's not something I'm going to use. Okay, It's something you guys are going to use and the students that follow you. So it would be great to share that and improve it as we go along. Keep tweaking it and improving it. So in addition to the Student Survival Guide, one thing I recommend is you run the bank account system. Now, the bank account system is something that I recommend everyone uses. And it's not because it's the best way of doing it. It's just a way of doing it that works. OK, and what it simply means is when you get paid your loans or your salary or your earnings, whatever you want to call it, or your payments from your parents or wherever it might be, or even your savings that you've saved up, that goes into one account. It's called your bills account. <clears throat> and from your bills account, you have all of your regular committed expenditure, like your rent on your property. OK, and any other rent insurance for your uh, belongings while you're away. And you have all these coming out of that account. And then every week on a Wednesday, 
you pay yourself your WAM, your WAM Wednesday. So every week on Wednesday, from your bills account into your WAM account, <clears throat> you pay your payment, and that's the money you spend for all your variable expenditure items. Okay, all of your variable expenditure items come out of your WAM Wednesday. And your WAM Wednesday will cover things like your food shopping for the week. It'll cover for your beer tokens, your wine and stuff, your partying, going out. Uh, any meals out and drinks. Um, any photocopying and printing you have to get done. Okay, it covers all of those expenses. <clears throat> Once it's gone, it's gone. Please don't dip back into your savings account or your bills account to cover it. Now, if you think about the log logistics or the psychology behind this, you get paid on a Wednesday. Now, I know most people think students party every single night, but I think once you're settled into it, it might form part of a routine. Earlier in the week, you might have friends around the house, whatever, and, and, and socialise inside. Um, you might go to some student bars and stuff um, certain days, but your bulk of your spending is more likely to be over the weekend. So if you've got a lump of payment coming in on a Wednesday, possibly you could be organised and do a week's shop on the Wednesday, so you've then got your weekend money and covered, and then by the time Sunday night comes, you might have spent most of that money, okay? Now, if it's all gone, you've only got Monday and Tuesday to wait, which you probably can have friends around the house and socialise in inside, so that rather than going out and spend lots of money, before you get paid again. So the psychology is you're always getting this dopamine boost, this payment of money into your account, it's probable that you will spend most of your time and most of your money over the weekend, and therefore, it's only a couple of days, Monday and Tuesday, before you get paid again. The psychology of running it this way helps you kind of feel that, oh, we've got a bit of money coming in. Now, you still have to make that money stretch. And that's why <clears throat> I want you to make sure that you go pre-armed with the cash flow forecast. You know where all the money is getting spent and where it's going to. But read the student survival guide um, at warrenshoot.com and um, let me know what you think. Most people, all the feedback I've had so far has been fantastic. Okay, but um, five things you need to know, I think you need to know before you go off to university. Firstly, I've just mentioned it, get a budget, get a cash flow. Okay, so a budget is basically what comes in, what goes out in a period of time. So let's say a monthly budget or weekly budget. That's okay, but it's almost like looking at something and saying, oh, this is what's going to happen now. And then we're going to do it again tomorrow. We're going to do it again next week, a week after. A cash flow is a budget repeated over time. So let's say it's a monthly budget. So your monthly budget is every single month. And I would do it for the course duration. So let's say three years or four years, depending on how long your course duration is. So get a budget, get a cash flow, and be realistic to it and stick to it. I'll have your wham on there, your allocation of payment. You make sure that's all you spend. Um, and just so you know, on the um, on the cash flow, there are things like holidays. Feedback from students said, like, hey, do you know what? We actually like to go away too. So we need to budget in there some money so we can go out on holiday. So a holiday payment is put in there as well. Um, shop around for everything shop around for everything so whether it's trainers or laptops things you need to buy use sites like idelo idelo is a fantastic site for price comparison to keep the things in there set alerts if it's not something you need urgently you can go to idelo put the figures in there say what you want set an alert and it will then ping up and it'll remind you when the price hits that fig that price and you can then go out and buy it um or you can look at price trending you think actually it's cheap now relative to what it was um, I can buy it, or actually, is, this is the most expensive time of the year to buy this. I'm going to hold off and wait a few more weeks or a month and buy it when it's on sale. <laughs> so shop around. Um, travel. I don't think you need a car at university, personally. Um, you might do, depending on where your university digs are and things like that, travelling back and forth to accommodation. But um, public transport in the UK is pretty good, despite what most people complain about it. I've travelled all over the world, and um, I, I, I'm, I'm pleased with it. Um, the, the train system is pretty fantastic. Um, and you can get a 16, 25-year-old rail card on it you need, and you save a third off of all your rail travel. So I think that would be a great Christmas gift for a, a student going off to university, 30 pounds a year or 70 pounds for the three years. Um, and I think those savings are gonna really add up. Um, fourth thing is um, despite all the lovely things that happen at university, lots of students um, 
have things stolen from them or get their premises broken into. Um, and UCAS recommend, or NUS, sorry, not UCAS, NUS, National Union of Students, suggest that like 20% of the students fall victim of some kind of crime uh, whilst they're at university. So ensure your belongings, you know, a modest insurance premium whilst you're at university is probably going to save you the estimated £900 that they feel that you would lose um, by being a victim of the crime. <clears throat> and to fifth thing, before you go off to university, get mum, get dad, get your brother, sister, whoever's the cook in the house and say, come on, look, I need to make sure I master, say, five good meals that are on budget. Okay, so five good meals are on budget. There are dozens out there you can do. Um, you know, Chicken fajitas, you can do on budget. Um, I don't know, what else you got? Chili con carne, something like that. It's got to be easy. Some kind of maybe some kind of curry dish. Bolognese has got to be on there. Um, some kind of things that are low cost and you're able to enjoy your friends. And then you've got those in the bag so that you can make sure when you do your weekly shop, you kind of like, okay, these are my kind of go-to meals. I've got a bit of subsistence here and allow my budget to sp uh, stretch that a little bit further. Remember, what's, what's the outcome? I'm very much outcome driven in what I do. What's the outcome? The outcome is so you can go away to university, have an amazing time, get a fantastic education, which is meaningful to set you up in your career. So when you start your career, you're not starting way back on a back foot thinking, geez, before I even consider a house, I've got to pay off £60,000 for the debt. You know, it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't, does not have to be that way, okay? You can come out of university with zero borrowing, okay? It may not be easy, but it is possible and it will just take a bit of planning and organization. Okay, so download the Student Survivor Guide and the spreadsheet and let me know what you think. <clears throat> but those all, have a great time. Okay, have a great time and be safe uh, while you're there. So, other things in the news this week. Just when we thought PPI was a thing of the past, remember PPI claims, payment protection insurance, we put a claim into our insurers, said, hey, we were inappropriately sold this insurance, or sometimes just given this insurance without even being asked, um, and we got some payments back on it. Um, there have been a few cases in the High Court um, where even after the PPI deadline had passed last August, uh, whereby people have been paid more money because so much of this money went in commission payments. They've been refunded some of their commission payments. So keep an eye on the news. There might be more to follow with the PPI fiasco. Oh, my goodness me. GCSE fiasco, ADOF fiasco, PPI fiasco. There's lots of it going on. Um, lifetime ISAs, leases. So these are these amazing savings vehicles that anyone from 18 to age 40 can take out. You can put into into them up to £4,000 a year and you get a 25% bonus on that money, so up to £1,000. <clears> the money can be used for one or two things, either retirement from age 60 onwards or the purchase of your first home. Okay. Now, if you access it for any other reason, there is a penalty applied to the um, encashment value. And you basically lose the value of the, but the bonus plus more. However, between March 2020, 6th of March 2020, and the 5th of April 2021, the excess penalty, so in other words, the um, penalty for cashing in, has been withdrawn, so you only now just lose the bonus. So what I'm trying to say is, please, if you don't need the money, leave it where it is. It's an amazing savings vehicle that you'll be grateful you've got when you need it. However, if you've fallen on hard times, if you've been made redundant, because there's lots of redundancies going on, if you're struggling financially making, meeting the bills because of the coronavirus and what's happened, this is put in place to support you. So you can withdraw the money without being disadvantaged. You lose the government bonus, but basically you get your money back. <clears throat> okay, so couple of readers questions this week uh, the first question came in it says do I pay tax on the sale of my rental property so what do you think do you pay tax on the sale of your rental property what I would say to you is if your rental property has made a gain then you could pay tax now tax law in the UK is incredibly complicated so I'm going to really simplify it here however I am you know, going to recommend you take advice from a tax advisor so a chartered tax advisor is the best person to get advice from most people are going to speak to an accountant which is equally as good but it's really a tax advisor that you want to speak to so you pay capital gains tax on investments 
and you pay tax on the difference between the sale price and the purchase price. If you buy something for £100 and sell it for £300, that's increased by £200. That's your capital gain. Okay. Now, you can offset some costs against this capital gain, such as capital items uh, that you uh, spend on the property. So if you've done um, put central heating in the property, something along those lines, if you've done some structural work to it, you can deduct the cost of those against your gain. Um, you can also deduct the cost of buying the property and selling the property against the gain. Okay, And then if that gain is greater than your tax-free allowance, which currently in this current tax year is 12300 then you pay capital gains tax on that based on the tax rate that you are. Now, rental properties have an excess um, tax rate on it. Uh, it depends how much you earn um, and <clears throat> it depends if you have ever lived in the property as well. So the complexities around it are probably too much for someone to want to listen to on a podcast. But needless to say that there are things you can do to reduce your capital gain tax legally and quite rightly so. Um, and you should do if you're able to. And you're, the key thing here is go and seek advice. Go and get advice from someone so they can help you sort it out. OK. Um, second question I had is, is it worth me leaving money to a charity in my will? Now, we're big charity supporters. Um, I sit on a um, panel of trustees with um, for a charity. And all I can say is so many, if not most, charities have been affected by the coronavirus, just like you and I have. So charities really are crying out for some kind of support right now. And um, if you are able to leave some money to a charity in your will, it would be it would be kind and reasonable to do so. There are also some advantages for you to leave some money in your will to a charity. First thing is any payments to a charity are free of inheritance tax. So what I mean by that is if you have an estate which is liable to inheritance tax and you gift money to a charity, that money will pass directly to the charity and neither your estate nor the charity will pay any inheritance tax on that gift. It's called a charitable legacy. But furthermore, if you leave 10% of your net estate which for the purpose of this conversation could be your taxable estate, if you leave 10% of your net estate to a charity, the tax rate on the remainder of your estate reduces from 40% down to 36%. So if there's any good time or reason to give to a charity, it really is to say that, hey, you're doing good for others who are in need, and also it's helping your own estate out as well. So any gifts to a charity are free of inheritance tax called charitable legacy and if you gift 10 percent of your net estate or more to a charity then your tax rate reduces from 40 down to 36 percent so we actually have many clients who will gift the tax-free amount so <clears throat> if you've got a main house and you've got children that basically will total up to five hundred thousand pounds per person so if you're a married couple that'll be one million pounds and then often they'll gift the excess of that to a charity. Um, so their estate pays zero in their tax because the £1 million is tax-free under the allowances and then the excess is taxed. Uh, it's not taxed, it's gone to a charity. Maybe I'll do a session on inheritance tax um, at another time. So if that... It, oh, sorry. That was um, uh, Siri talking to me about inheritance tax. If there is anything you'd like to know on inheritance tax or any other things you'd like me to cover... Um, as long as it's in my, re in my remit of confidence and competence, um, I'm very happy to do so. And inheritance tax is something I talk about often. So we also have every week a smarter spender section. And what, what I really mean by this is I really want to get across that spending money is not a bad thing. OK, spending money is not bad. Spending other people's money, i.e. on a credit card or money you don't have or spending money that's earmarked for a future event is bad. So I need you to make sure you save and invest first. And we earmark ideally 20% of your income for that. Um, but that does account for short-term savings as well. Um, and then we allow roughly about 30% of your money for general spending, about 50% of your money for household bills. So spending money isn't bad. I never think spending money is bad. I think you get a lot of enjoyment from it from you and your family. But spend wisely uh, and be a smarter spender. And that's where they come from. 
So um, what we look at is things that have dipped in price, and this week things that have dipped in price vary from PC monitors, um, down about 14%, garden hoses down 30%, but what really got my, what my attention was weights, weight training equipment, gym equipment, it's down 40% on last week. That's a massive reduction. Um, it's interesting as well with the gyms opening and stuff like that, more and more people wanting to train outside in the parks and stuff like that, which I think is phenomenal, it's awesome. But obviously when the cooler weather comes, you might want to train in your own home. If we go through another lockdown, even if it's localized, you might want to have a gym equipment home. So actually at the moment, they're 40% cheaper than elsewhere. So remember, go and find the items that you want, go onto IDLO, type in the figures, and it will find the cheapest place you can buy them, and it'll also show you the price history as well. <clears throat> um, we think um, people will be considering to buy this week. Um, <laughs> did you know that September, more babies are born in September than any other month of the year? We'll wonder why, okay? So at the moment, in not at the moment, but in September, car seats and things like that are the cheapest that they ever are throughout the year so 15 percent cheaper to buy a car seat in september compared to the most expensive month which is july it's bizarre isn't it july august september how can it be so much cheaper i think it's about getting new stock in but um yeah 15 percent cheaper um in september versus versus july so i think that's pretty awesome pretty cool um and then obviously we're having this conversation the end of august 2020 you'll probably hear it beginning of september so it's back to school and it's back to school in my house ollie and bella getting their stuff together um they're getting their school bags and things like that so back to school get onto idlo have a search around make sure you're getting the best price making sure you're bang for the buck your money's going as far as it can um because you know, these are expensive times i i see it and experience it myself you know the kids are just saying oh, i need this dad i need this i need this and it just keeps going on and then you've got to dig a bit deeper and say do you need it or do you want it you know what what is what's the difference here do you need it or you want it but yeah you know, if we have an allowance of this amount of money what are you going to buy um and that helps them you know don't try and protect them from this have get have the conversation with them because they will then understand how to spend money you know if you shelter someone from spending money how are they supposed to be responsible adult spending money um when they grow up <clears throat> so you can say well look, look we have this amount of money to spend because bear in mind it's august september october november and then december christmas coming around yes you know, so we have this amount of money to spend um there's two of you so we're going to split it what what do you think what do you need to get with that so having those conversations with children is fantastic <clears throat> um if i haven't shared with you i'll share another time but i had the conversation with my children this week about mcdonald's I, the, the conversation i had with them when they were younger about being in a mcdonald's now there are three people in the mcdonald's restaurant there are the um, owners of the restaurant there are the consumers of the restaurant eating it and there are staff working there and the difference between each of those and that really comes into you know financial education for children and how really important it is and it starts with you discussing it at home. So, hey, if money's tight, be honest. Say, hey, money's tight. You know, it's it's fine. It's okay to be tight with money. You know, having that attitude of discussion and openness is, is is healthy. And it's healthy for you. So they, they have their expectations. And it's health, healthy for them um, as well. So, um, yeah, so that's good for both. So, remember... Um, I appreciate all your questions that come in. I answer all of them and we're able to get a couple of them onto the podcast session and uh, share those um, answers with all of you. And uh, I'm very excited. So hopefully next few weeks we'll be in our new studio. Uh, we've invested into a new mic or we will be investing in a new mic. Uh, Vince is just picking it out at the moment. So um, we should sound a little bit crisper, clarity and uh, nicer. But um, I am enjoy doing these. I love, I do them because I like getting the questions for you. So that's fantastic. And remember, if you have any questions, if you are struggling in any way, reach out. And don't forget, we are doing the coaching sessions as well uh, for £25. That's going to charity. I do need you to make a payment because otherwise you won't value it at all. So if you want to get involved with those, just message me, warren at warrenshoot.com. But until next time, please, thank you so much. Take care and uh, be safe. Enjoy the rest of the summer. <laughs>